Hello and welcome to Little Things with Amber L.B. Swenson. We are beginning a new series today on singleness. Now we have a couple of different um, vantage points that we're gonna look at singleness through. So today is just the beginning with an episode that I'm calling Single for a Season. And I have a very special guest with me today. Her name is Hannah Schirmerhorn. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, Hannah. Hello, thank you for having me. Did I say your name right? Yes, you totally did. <laughs> Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. All right. So I, you have a book. It's called A Single Life to Live. Um, and the subtitle is Stop Waiting for Your Life to Begin and Thrive Where God Has You Today. It's an excellent book. I really enjoyed it very much. You're a very gifted writer and you have a little bit of wit to you too, which was fun. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. So Hannah, just introduce yourself to my listeners. Just give us a 30 to 60 second, this is who I am. Yeah. Well, my name's Hannah Schimmerhorn, and I recently had a book come all out called A Single Life to Live. So I'm an author now. But before that, I did some different things. I went to school for electrical engineering, and I worked in legal and marketing and product development and all of that up until writing my book and that coming out. So that's that's kind of what I'm talking about now is, is this book that I wrote about being single. Yes, and a ph phenomenal book. And I just want to preface it by saying, so that no one is taken off guard, it was kind of unfortunate timing because yes. your book came out right about the time you got married, did it not? Yes. And that was such a funny thing for me. I was like, man, God has a sense of humor because I wrote my entire book and then I had the very last chapter left. And it was a chapter, you know, some chapters I really struggled through and had to work out. And the last chapter was one I just had and I knew what I was going to write. So right when I was about to write that chapter, I met the guy who had become my husband <laughs> and he even like asked me out and I was like, no, I'm I'm writing a book about singleness. I can't date. What are you thinking? And then it kind of became more and more apparent, like, no, I like this guy. I should date him. And then uh, after writing the book, it took about two years to actually get published, come out, all of that. And then right when it's coming out, it's like, well, I just got married. So <laughs> being single is great, guys. I promise. <laughs> so here's my book on singleness because yes. I just kept. But that is not to take away from the fact that you did spend six or seven years single. Yes. So you did have a, a season, and especially at that time in your life, because in your early 20s, that's a hard time when a lot of people are getting married. So that doesn't detract from your season of singleness, I don't think. And it's still valid that you wrote down the lessons that you've learned. So that's what this book really is talking about, even though, full disclosure, you are now an old married woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Married for about seven months now. <laughs> Ooh, yep. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> All right, so let's dive right in because you broke off an engagement and that's how you start the book. You broke off an engagement. So you were planning a wedding and just like that, you broke it off. And that's such a courageous thing to do. I had to stop there and think about how many women don't have the courage to do that. They maybe sense that something is a little off in the relationship, or maybe there's even been things that they've struggled with in the relationship. Maybe they've broke up with the person a couple of times. They keep going back because they don't want to experience that season of loneliness. So what would you say to those women who are like, mm, I'm sticking with it because even though I maybe sense there are things that aren't right, or I know there are things that aren't right, it's better than being alone. What mm -hmm. would you say to them? Yeah, I think there's a lot of things there and it is such a struggle. It was so much of a struggle for me to actually reach the decision to call that off because I faced all the same things where I'm like, I don't want to be single again. I don't want to be alone yeah. again. But I think a lot of people gave me some some good advice when I was trying to make that decision too. And some people told me that you can actually be more lonely when you're in a marriage than when you're actually single. And People have told me that who have gone through it themselves and said, you know, if you marry someone and you're struggling with them right now in this engagement or dating, that's only going to be magnified when you get married and then you're going to have to deal with that for the rest of your life. So something that may seem smaller now or you might just have some suspicions right now, that's just going to be something that you have to wake up and potentially deal with all the time moving forward. So 
It may seem scary to be single or to be lonely, but I think what I found, even though I never wanted it, was that God made me face that stuff. And I realized Mm -hmm. it's really not as bad as you make it out to be when you're in a relationship. I know I thought, oh, if I stay in this relationship, you know, I know what's going to happen in my future to some extent. I know who I'll be with, all those things. But if I become single, that's just me being alone and I have no idea what's going to happen. But in that, God has really exceeded my expectations of what would happen in my singleness. And yeah, I was like six, seven years of being single. Um, And out of that, I mean, a book came. I didn't even go to school for writing or anything like that. And I changed careers and I traveled. I don't want to hear that. Okay. I don't want to hear that. You're like Linda Buxa. She didn't go to school for writing either. She's like, it just fell into it. I'm like, stop. There's a lot of us who struggle for a long time, worked really hard. And you're just like, oh. No, it wasn't easy. It was not easy to get the book out. But just seeing that God took kind of the worst experiences and my biggest fears and singleness and turned it into a career for me and something so beautiful. So I think if you're struggling with, you know, what should I do? It's totally okay to be single and really great things can come out of that. So your fear may be there, but it can definitely go away and God can really surprise you with what he can do. Okay, I want to talk about. I mean, you had the wedding plan, did you not? Yeah, yeah, I had a wedding, wedding dress and yep, okay, everything. So let's talk about just a few of the things because I, as I think about that, I'm thinking about the things that would hold me back from calling off a wedding, including having to face all the relatives, yes, and your friends, and I mean, this is not a small thing. So no. what what was the worst part? Uh, of this. I mean, or what were some of the worst parts? Yeah, I think thankfully my parents were really helpful and leading up to it, I'd had a lot of conversations with them about breaking off the engagement and everything like that. So yeah, so they, they were just kind of listening and they wanted me to end it, but they never told me to. So they were very nice about just being there for me and listening. Um, But then when it came to actual wedding stuff, they were nice about like, we'll tell people, we'll help you with what we can. So that was really good. But I think some of the worst parts were just going to church and having people by me being like, are you super excited to get married? It's getting really close. And then me just like try not to cry or just starting to cry. And that was even before the decision was made. It was me trying to hold it together and be like, things are fine. I'm okay. Everything's normal. But in reality, you know, everything was so hard and I was struggling so much. So I think it was more people's expectations of me and feeling like I was disappointing them was the big thing and even my own idea of how my life should turn out and that being disappointed as well. So I was just dealing with all of that and thankfully friends and family were super encouraging about everything and not that, you know, people necessarily knew why I was doing it. They're still really, really nice about it. So that continued to help. But I think so many people know when you're engaged and going to get married that having that conversation over and over and over is just draining, especially when you're not happy about it happening. Right. So how old were you at the time? I was, I, like, how old was I? I was a senior in college. So I would have been so like, like 21, 22. 22. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds yeah, right. Which is super, I, I think it's, I, I really give you a lot of credit. I think because so many people are getting married at that time, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, All my so friends. many of your friends are yep. engaged at that time. And so to honestly take that step to go, there's something wrong. It's just not right. And to when everybody else is going through the motions and you want to be in that phase, that's, that's really a courageous thing. I think that was a good thing that you did. Clearly you're happy (laughs) with my decision. Yeah. Thank you. It wasn't, it wasn't happy at first. It obviously took years, but yeah, God definitely helped with all of that. Okay. So during your single season, Did you have a lot of friends trying to set you up? And if so, how did you feel about that? Yes, I had so many friends try to set me up. And I think at first I was very happy about it because so many people were like, oh, I know someone who broke off an engagement and they met someone a month later and they got married and everything's fine. So I was like, okay, cool. Like I didn't find my person the first try, but I'll just find them right away. So I was excited at first, but then I think when I started dating or trying to, I waited about a year and I was still just like, 
I don't know what to talk about because so much of my life is about yeah. what just happened. And so much of my life was with this other person. So I was like, I don't, like I was going back to high school memories because <laughs> I didn't know what to talk about. Um, right. And then I just kind of felt like maybe I'm not ready for this or I would keep going on dates and it just wasn't working out. So I got to the point where I just got sick of going on dates and kind of frustrated with it and realized that I cared more about my friends caring about my hopes and my dreams and what were what was going on in my life than what my relationship status was. So I had to kind of talk to people or, you know, I had some good friends that started asking things more like, you know, how'd that presentation at work go or what yeah. are the dreams you're pursuing and things like that. And that was just way better and way healthier for me to have relationships like that than, oh, you're single. Let's try to set you up because dating is so... Oh, just exhausting <laughs> yeah, and trying is. to meet someone and connect with them and then realizing it's not happening and do that over and over and over like that is just so exhausting. So having those lasting relationships where people aren't going to go away and they care about what's going on, that was helpful. And I basically just reached the point where I was done dating. <laughs> and of course, that is when I met my husband, as yeah. a lot of people will say. But I think it was maybe a year or so where I was just like, nope, I don't need to do this anymore. I wrote a book about being happy being single. I am happy with where I am. And I really don't understand, you know, why I would need to get married. God changed my mind mm -hmm. about that. Um, but yeah, I think I think that can definitely, that definitely is hard to, to be set up a lot. So had you dated all during your college years? Pretty yeah. much then? Yep. I started when I was a freshman um, oh, with the person no. I got engaged to. Yep. So it was basically oh, wow. all of college. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, so I want to hit on what you said, though, because I think that's so important for anyone at any stage. I, I'm at a point now where I have a couple of friends who are widowed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so important to talk to the person about what's going on in their life rather than their relationship status. Yeah. And that's what I heard you say and how that helped you because it, it doesn't matter your relationship status. And, you know, you don't have a timeline that you can, you know, you can't just conjure up right. an eligible bachelor. And so for us as on the outside, when you are married or dating or whatever, um, it seems like a good tip to keep in mind for our single friends to just be involved in their life and what's going on with them. And, you know, if they bring up the relationship status or things with that, that's a totally different thing mm -hmm. rather than, you know, bringing it up and wanting to find someone for them. That's not necessarily helpful. No. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, exactly. And I feel like most people who are dating and want to be in a relationship trying to find someone, they're already stressed out by that area of their life. Okay. So to, you know, bring it up and push it and even have people kind of ask, like, why aren't you dating anyone? Oh, I know this person. It's like, this is already stressful for me. I already know that I want this to be different. So continuing to reinforce that almost something's wrong with you because you're single and you need to be fixed and, you know, find someone so that part of your life is fixed is just not how Helpful. It's more you're good where you are. God cares about yeah. you where you are. And God loves marriage just as much as he loves singleness. So right. reinforcing that, I think, is just a better long-term thing for single people than, oh, let's try this person. Let's try this person. Let's try this person. Yeah. And this really goes back to identity because you, mm -hmm. in your book, you talked about you struggled with your identity for a while. And what did you find out when you really delved into, hey, if I'm putting all my identity into it, my relationship status. I'm kind of off track here. So what did you find out about that? Yeah. So for me, when I broke off the engagement, I basically felt all the negative things that come with singleness. So I felt, you know, like I wasn't loved. I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I was alone. I felt like there were no plans for my life. And I just really struggled with all of those things. And, you know, wondering why do I need to be here when it's so far from everything that I had hoped for for my life? So I took that on as my identity, all those negative things. 
But then actually one day I was listening to a sermon at church and they talked about this concept of identity where, you know, you aren't any of those disappointed appointments, those Mm -hmm. hopes and dreams that are broken. You're not any of the good things that you've done or happening in your life. The only identity we should have is that we're loved by God. And Mm -hmm. it's like something I knew, but I never had to apply to my life in such a, you know, intense way. So when I actually realized like all of these things that have happened to me are not me and I don't matter because they happened or they didn't happen. All that matters is God loves me. And no matter what happened in the past and no matter what happens in the future, God loves me. And that is the coolest thing (laughs) in the entire world to actually think about. And C.S. Lewis has a quote that says, he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. And I think that's just such a powerful example of what it means to be loved by God. I don't need anything else. So all of a sudden going from, oh, I need to work hard and try to get in a relationship and fix this part in my life turns into, oh, God has plans for me and he has me here because he loves me. So there must be something going on here. So I don't need to try to fix or change this. God has me here for a reason and I can trust him no matter what's going on. So that completely changed the game for me. That was the biggest thing that I learned and singleness that totally changed my perspective. And it's so powerful because it's a lesson that we have to reiterate our entire life long. Mm-hmm. You know, people can get stuck in being married and then when they're widowed, you have you, you're like, "Well, what is my identity?" in being a mom and then you, there's the empty nest and you're like, "Well, wh- what am I now?" Yep. I work in a nursing home and people who all of a sudden, you know, are not the professional, who are not the farmer, who are not they all, they struggle, you know, and, and you are absolutely right. If your identity is based on anything other than being a redeemed child of God, you're going to be let down because Mm -hmm. things will change through different seasons. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I feel like for me, just being on the bad end of that, (laughs) God, let me see like, oh, you're placing your identity in all the wrong things and you really need to address it. But once you have the positive view of that, man, it's, so much better to live that way. Right. Well, that was such a great lesson for you to learn at a young age. That was huge. Yeah. So loneliness was a part of your struggle. So what helped you cope? Because you did mention that a lot of times, you know, you'd, you'd feel like being with someone and going out with friends or something, but they're with their significant other. And then your friends started having kids. Yes. So then they start having a baby. So then you can't necessarily just ask them to go out and So how did you cope when you did feel lonely? Yeah, I think the story in the Bible of Jeremiah really helped me because he was a prophet who had to speak out against the people around him saying that they're doing all these bad things and they need to repent. And as a result of that, people really hated him and they did everything to him from putting him in solitary confinement to his hometown trying to kill him to just putting him in a cistern to sink into the mud and die. Um, So he had the loneliest life of anyone that I know. And reading his story, and then he's able to say, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior and not back down from what God had him doing, made me say, okay, I feel lonely as a single person, but man, I cannot complain compared to Jeremiah. I am going through nothing compared to that guy. Uh, So that really helped me to say, okay, what is he doing or what did he do and what can I do? And something that I saw a lot in the book of Jeremiah is that he just went to God and he said, I'm frustrated. This is how I feel. And he was very honest with God about all the struggles he was having. And then, you know, he could get the reassurance from God of, you know, this is this is what's going on and I'm here for you and all of that. So for me in my life, not being as bad as Jeremiah, I could reframe of, okay, yes, I feel lonely when I have no plans at night and no one is there, or I feel lonely when I'm in a group of people and I'm the only single person and they're all talking about, you know, their marriages or their kids. But God has me for here for a reason, just like he did for Jeremiah. And he chose some people to be in certain seasons of their life, like married and kids. And for me, he's having me be single right now. So again, if God loves me more than I can even fathom, this is what's right for me right now. And I can be hopeful and happy about that because that's the purpose that God has me for right now. I think it just really came down to a lot of trusting 
that God had me there for a reason. And then also very practically finding people in different seasons of life who I could connect with. So I did a small group Bible study and it was people that were my age or younger. There were singles, there were people who were married, people with kids, and then there are people who were my parents' age and meeting with them regularly and getting everyone's perspective from different seasons of life made me feel, you know, I have this community and it doesn't have to be all single people. It's not all married people. So I feel like I'm weird, but I have this community that is across so many different seasons and ages and everything like that that's here to support me and I can work with them and everything like that. So I think practically finding something like that that can encourage you in God's word too has been so, so helpful to me. I'm a huge advocate for small group Bible study. It definitely changed. Uh, My husband and I were in one for 17 years and we raised our kids with this group and it was it was an absolute godsend to have that community like you said we were studying the bible and that's what rooted us together but then you know you have this community that you can text someone and say you know help i pray for me we're going through this or and since we met regularly you know we were all in tune with each other's lives and yeah. Just like you said, you can be at totally different phases. I mean, very different phases. And you you bond over the word of God and that yes. fellowship. Such yeah. a huge thing. I'm glad that you got involved with that. That would be really a good hint for anyone listening at any phase. If they're feeling lonely and left out, a little Jeremiah-ish. I that That's one of my favorite books in the Bible, too. Yes. One of the things I love about the book of Jeremiah is God's responses, because yes. God didn't always be, he wasn't always like, oh, yeah, that sounds miserable, Jeremiah. He was like, Jeremiah, take that back. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> you start honoring me and I'm going to work through you, but you, you take that. And sometimes that's the rebuke I need, you know, because we mm-hmm. can fall into that feeling sorry for ourselves or thinking things are so bad. But then, like you said, you read about him being put in the cistern in the mud and you're like, eh, yes, I might not have it so bad. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you recognized, uh, I love the part of the book where you recognized, you started recognizing the lies you were buying into mm-hmm. and you use Jeremiah's life too. you like, Jeremiah could think, well, nobody loved him. But then clearly he saw how God loved him. So you started recognizing that you were buying into some of Satan's lies. So what were some of those lies and how did you start recognizing them as lies? Yeah, I feel like I had so many that I had to work through. Um, So definitely things like feeling like I've done something wrong to be in the situation in life that I didn't want to be in, feeling that I was alone, um, feeling like no one cared about me, all of those kind of things. And I think I honestly just started writing down whenever I'd feel something negative that kind of kept on happening and keeping track of that. Because what I realized is if I don't address this stuff, it's just going to keep going through my mind over and over and over And the more that I let that happen, sometimes the worse it becomes. And then it can reach this point where it's just what I'm thinking all the time is these negative things. So I just kind of, honestly, I had like a wall that I wrote stuff on, just put post-it notes on of like, okay, I feel like no one cares about me. And then I had to be like, okay, but what's the truth? That's just a lie that I'm believing. So what's the truth? And there's some logical truth to that. Okay. I have friends. God has given me a lot of people, but then there's also scriptural truth to that as Mm -hmm. well. Um, So, you know, God is always with me. God says that over and over. Surely I'm with you always. So I just kind of wrote down every single one and then was like, why is this a lie? And then, you know, logic and then using God's word and reinforcing that so that every time I'd go through my mind, I would have to go through that train of thought again so that, you know, when I would start to feel lonely, it's like, nope, God's with me. I'm good. And it and would start happening faster and faster and faster. So I had to do that. And I think also just confronting fear. Um, I went to a 10th Avenue North concert a few years ago, and he talked about how every fear we have is based off of a lie we believe. So we can actually trace back to the lie and see what's wrong with that lie to take away our fears. So I think a lot of singleness really deals with fear too of, you know, 
know, fear that nothing's going to happen in my life that I want to happen and, and stuff like that. So to trace that back to, okay, what are all the lies I'm believing that, you know, God yeah. doesn't have plans for me, that God doesn't care about me, and then actually confronting those, that did so much good work for me just in my daily life of what I was thinking. It's such a great discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, what you did in recognizing that, hey, I'm buying into these lies that are just going, you know, they're recircling all the time, you know, and, and, and of course, to confront that with scripture, take mm -hmm. every thought captive and to recognize, okay, this is a lie. And what's the scripture that combats it? And then also to see, hey, wait, I can tangibly see this in my life, see that this is a lie. That's a huge discipline. If all of us would just do that much, then we wouldn't be so at war with the thoughts in our head all the time because we can really do some serious damage and go some really dangerous places in our mind if we let ourselves think on things that are not true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you must have a lot of, uh, you got a lot of inspiration from concerts because yes. the book <laughs> came about from uh, Switchfoot, John Foreman. Yes, it yes. was just John Foreman. Concert, yeah, he correct? was doing like his solo thing. Yeah, which was amazing. Yeah, so say, talk about that. You say it, you talk about it in the book. That's how this book came to be. So yes. talk about what he did and said that caused you to bite the bullet. Yeah, so um, he had a concert and it was the first time I ever saw him. I honestly didn't even know that he was solo. So it was just this great experience overall. So how did um, you end up going? Because uh, yeah. yeah, one of my friends just invited me and she always invites me to really good concerts. Like every single okay. one, I normally haven't heard of them. And like I'd heard of Switchfoot, but this yeah. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So she invited me um, and we got our tickets. And the ticket said that there was a movie at the beginning of the concert. And we're like, what? Like we were considering yeah. not even going because we were just confused. Uh, so we went and he played this documentary that he made called 25 and 24. And in this documentary, he um, did 25 concerts in 24 hours in California. Yeah. And they're at all these cool places. Like he went to his high school and played with his high school band. And then he went to a children's hospital that his daughter was at for a time and just all sorts of things and played with different people and went around and did this. And basically the documentary was about him having this dream of playing 25 concerts in 24 hours. That seemed completely crazy. People were all saying like, you're insane for doing this. But he's like, you know what? I have this dream. It's on my heart and I need to pursue it. So he did it. And through that, that there's just so many amazing things that happen, community building, you know, all sorts of things. And one of the things was um, at the end of this documentary, they gave us this piece of paper and it said 25 and 24. My dream is to. And when I got that piece of paper, I was like, man, I've been thinking about writing a book for so long. And it's been this whisper that's been in my head and it's getting louder and louder and louder. And then that night it was like, I have to write this book. That is what my dream is to do because just like for John, he's like, I'm going to do this. I don't know where it's going to go. Maybe it's not going to be the thing I expect, but I have yeah. to follow this. And I had that same moment of, you know, I don't know if anything will come out of this, but I have this and it's not going away. So I think I need to pursue it. And I'm so glad I did, obviously. So yeah, yeah that's that's how it came about through through that concert, which was really, really cool. Yeah, that is neat. That that is neat. Thanks for sharing that story. Yeah, of course. Um, you learn to reconcile yourself to the idea idea of waiting, and mm -hmm. that seems like for a Christian, that is just something that we need to get used to. Anyway, we all want God to answer our prayers the way we want. And again, this was for your season of singleness, but there are people who are waiting to get pregnant who are struggling with infertility. There are people who on the other end of the spectrum, the people that I take care of who are waiting to die and who are wondering, why does God still have me here? I can't do anything. I just have to be taken care of. And as a Christian, it, it's so much of our life, the whole expectations, like you said, your expectations got in the way at first. And so much of our life requires us to lean into what God is doing and just trust him and to learn to wait. What blessings did you find in this season of waiting? Yeah, I feel like for me, there were a lot of stories in the Bible that started sticking out when I started mm -hmm. focusing on waiting. And it's not something that ever crossed my mind until I was in the point of waiting because yeah. I definitely 
felt like I might never get married. So what am I supposed to do in my lifetime of waiting? Because <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but some of the stories that stuck out were people like um, a blind man who Jesus healed or a cripple at a well who was, you know, crippled for so, so long, like decades yes. of his life. And then to all of a sudden be healed later. Um, the big one that I wrote about in my book was the story of Lazarus. And um, God could have essentially come and healed Lazarus when he was sick, but Jesus allowed Lazarus to die and he allowed people to go through suffering and waiting, you know, what's going to happen. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead, which was a way better ending than anyone could expect. And same with, you know, the people who were sick that Jesus healed and things like that. So by doing that, if Jesus had just healed Lazarus at the beginning, people would have been like, sweet, another miracle. This is great. Yeah. But instead, he raised him from the dead and just showed so much more of what he could do and his power and his glory. And as a result, all these people were believing in Jesus. And, you know, so many people might be in heaven because he chose to do it that way. So it's just really cool as you start looking in the Bible to see all these stories where people were waiting and they were suffering and maybe they felt like nothing was happening, but God was working in that. And he was working out for this beautiful story. And it might not be something we we necessarily see in our lives. It could be something that, you know, we get to heaven and it's like, because this happened, this thing happened and you didn't know that, but this is what the big picture is. So I think that makes it hard because we'd rather see those results right away of, oh, I can suffer. Like, like for me, I'm like, if I would have known when I broke off an engagement what was coming, I would have jumped into breaking it off immediately. But right. we don't see that till later. And God showed me this, you know, very kindly, you know, six, seven, yes. eight years after all of this is happening. But that doesn't always happen. But it is super encouraging to know that even if you feel like you're waiting, you know, for decades of your life or something like that, God is working in that. And I'm sure when we get to heaven, we can ask him like, so what was that about? <laughs> And it'll have some amazing answer that just completely blows our minds because that's the pattern we see over and over in the Bible. Well, over and over and over. I mean, so mm -hmm. many stories, Abraham and Sarah waiting, yes. um, David being on the run, Joseph, 13 years between being sold to rising. I mean, so many, Hannah, yes. not having a baby. I mean, there's so many instances in the Bible of waiting and waiting and waiting. It seems like a pretty big deal to God. Like, mm -hmm. His timing, not ours. His timing, not ours. You know, we're always in that tension of, but God, I want this to happen now. Yes. And since I want it, you should probably want it too. Whereas he, like you said, is working and weaving all these things behind the scenes. Like it's not time and, and there's other things happening here, mm -hmm. but it's a hard lesson to learn to trust that. Yes. But the Bible's there for a reason. Yes. <laughs> Yes, there are and I feel like so it, many examples. Yeah, and I feel like if you don't see it in your own story, it's like look to that and know that that's the same God who's taking care of you right now because you can be assured Amen. he's he's doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Pastor Mike, they just aired a uh, tough questions with Pastor Mike, and it was someone who said, you know, I'm single. Does that mean there's something wrong with me? And his answer was, first of all, being single is not like a curse. You know, right. God doesn't say you're better if you're single, you're better if you're married. But then he said, you know, maybe like, I don't know what your character <laughs> flaws are. I don't know, <laughs> you know, what you're struggling with. But um, you called it baggage in mm -hmm. your in your book. Like, sometimes you just have to deal with your baggage. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. Like, if they're not in a relationship right now, they don't want anybody to say, don't tell me to deal with my baggage, right. you know. But why would you disagree with that? Why would you say this is the perfect time to deal with your baggage? Oh, yeah, definitely. I feel like if you are longing for a relationship and that's something that, you know, God's going to grant you in the future, if you bring those things to it, it's only going to magnify it and make it so much bigger. Mm -hmm. And then you're bringing someone else into it as well. And even if you're single, it may feel like no one else is involved in your baggage. And that can be true to an extent, but there's still you're still living 
being in community, there's still people around you and it's still going to be affecting them in some way. It's not going to be a direct way like marriage necessarily, but it's still going to be there, whether it's friends or coworkers or family or things like that. So I think one of the blessings in singleness, depending on where you are in your life, if you're like a single parent, then you don't have as much free time for sure. But I know for, for me, when I was like younger and single, I had free nights, I had free weekends where I didn't have as much going on because I just graduated from college. And with that time, there's, you know, you can invest in yourself and making yourself better and working with God to improve those things. Or you can just, I don't know, go and do whatever else you want to do. But by doing that, that's going to help you for the future, no matter where you're going with the future, whether it's being in a relationship or being single that's only going to make things easier. And for me too, like learning to trust God in the hardest things in my life, that applies to everything moving forward. So I'm glad that I was forced to work on that in my singleness, because if I moved forward the way I was before, I'd be freaking out about everything like when I was younger. So I think singleness is such a great time to start working on those things. And I mean, everyone has baggage, so (laughs) you can, you can start wherever, but it's, it's so good to be able to start doing that and then bring that to any relationship that moves forward, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship or anything like that. I think what you just said, I just want to highlight that just for a second, because I think that's a key point here. We all have character flaws and If we take the time to do a little self-examination or if we have good enough friends who kind of say, hey, I I notice you fall into this a lot or or what have you. You said if we would just deal with those, it's going to affect all your relationships, not just romantic relationships. So even if you are married right now and you're impatient and you're constantly impatient with your husband or your children, if you start working on that, that's going to really help it's going to be beneficial to your relationships right now, yes. whether it's your coworkers or your family or, or even your prayer life with God, when you're impatient with your prayers, you know, like, God, where have you been? I've been praying this. <laughs> yes. So there's no bad time to start working on your character flaws. Exactly. Yeah. Cause it's going to improve so much. It's going to improve all your relationships here and your relationships there. Mm-hmm. So key point. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you had a season of singleness and now you're married. What, if anything, do you miss about being single? What did you get to do when you were single? That clearly is not part of the plan right now. Yeah, I feel like I'm pretty blessed where honestly, like I can still do a lot. I think when I was single, it was easier to travel a lot for work. I was doing that at the time and I could, I had different products I was working on that were in Europe. So I had this awesome opportunity where I could go to France for a meeting or Sweden or Switzerland, things like that. And now leaving is really sad because now I have something I care so much about being home. So that makes that aspect harder for sure. That's a definite key one. But I think more from a high level, it's very easy to feel complacent because I'm married now and think, oh, Mm. this was the biggest thing that, you know, I was so nervous about and worried about and it's come true and I'm not struggling in that anymore. And I think so much good comes out of struggle and, you know, having to work through that tension and figure out things. So there's definitely new challenges and new things to figure out, but it has been a funny switch of, you know, this thing that I hoped for my entire life has finally come true. But that doesn't mean that my life is perfect or that, you know, all the happiness is there every single day. I still have to keep working, but in different ways and different things like that. So that's been a big shift for me, too. Yeah, I was just reading a devotion by Spurgeon yesterday on Malachi 3.3 about God saying he was a refiner's fire. And Spurgeon said in this devotion, look at your life and you will see the most growth in times of affliction. Mm hmm. And so he said, though we long for the days, the good days, the days where all the blessings abound, do not despise the days of affliction because that is where the lessons are learned. And you hit the nail on the head. So often when you're out of the affliction, when you come out on the other side, you don't necessarily see that same growth because you're not searching like Mm -hmm. you are so much when you're going through that affliction. Um, but like, but like you said, there's always other things you can work on. And don't worry, affliction comes around the corner <laughs> all too often. Yes. Seems like you get out of one, take a deep breath because something else 
enters in. So yes, that's so true. What about you mentioned traveling, but are, are there other things that you're really glad that you did when you were single? That I mean, you did not waste your season. I mean, you might have had a little bit of time when you adjusted mm-hmm, to being for single, sure. but then you embraced it. Yeah. yeah. So what? 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 I'm trying to. I'm asking this for the people who might be single right now, especially young singles who are hoping to get married someday. Yes. You know, what are some things that you are really glad that you did? I heard you say the Bible study aspect. I think that is huge and key getting involved in a Bible studying community. Yes. What other things are did you do when you were single that you're so glad you did? Yeah, I think for me, I started asking myself the question of what would my life need to look like so that it doesn't matter if I'm single mm. or if I'm married and that would make me feel really happy in that life. Um, and obviously all you need is God there, but God also gave us interests and different things to pursue. So for me, just pursuing writing, something that I didn't go to school for, something that just you know felt like a hobby and mm-hmm. an idea I had in my head, following that and seeing what can I do with this right now and the time that I have being single and just doing that, you know, I didn't know that it would get published or come out or anything like that. I think just following that and realizing hey, God gave me this talent and it's something I've never really explored before. Um, Mm. And maybe I should see what's going on there. So I think for anyone who's single, it's like, what are your hobbies and your passions and your different talents that maybe you've been putting on the back burner because you think, oh, once I get married, that's when my life will begin and that's when I'll start doing all of these things. I think that's an easy thing to fall into, but instead we can say, no, my life is happening right now and I can start making those steps into my dream life of what I want and just doing something, you know, I would go home and sometimes it'd be 10 minutes a day writing. Sometimes it'd be five hours at night writing, you know, and just doing those small steps of, who did God make me uniquely to be? And, you know, Mm. what things can I uniquely pursue? So I think for me, I had that big moment of it's writing. But another thing I've heard is, you know, what breaks your heart and what can you do to help that if you don't know exactly what you should be pursuing? So looking into volunteering and organizations and all of those things are another huge thing that helped me in singleness of I can help other people with this time. I can work on myself. I can, you know, do all of those things. So I think that was the biggest thing for me and not waiting to have a husband to start, you know, being financially good. And I bought a duplex and I lived in one unit and rented the other unit and started doing all of those kind of things rather than, you know, waiting until yeah. getting married to do all that. So how has your life changed, if at all, since the book? Yeah, <laughs> a lot. Um, when I found out I was getting published, I kind of struggled a lot with what I wanted to do. And I was working in my corporate job. And eventually that got, you know, so um, maybe I got kind of pushed in a direction where I'm like, I don't, I'm not enjoying this anymore. And it got so much of a struggle that I realized that leaving was an option. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a huge blessing that I could quit to pursue writing full time. So that is something I never expected in my life to happen. Yeah. So that has been amazing. So I've really, really enjoyed being able to do that. So writing and speaking now is, you know, some of the big stuff that I'm doing. But I think it also kind of showed me that here's a dream that I had for a long time for many years. And I'm so happy that that came true. But it wasn't the book itself coming out that made me feel very happy. It was the writing of it and struggling with it. And, you know, thinking about like, if I'm just helping one person, that's what matters. So that was cool. And then being able to talk to people and see that they are going through or have gone through exactly what I went through because I thought I was so alone in it and seeing that, you know, this is actually helping them of what I'm saying. That's like, wow, I can't believe that I wrote something that actually helped. I just have to mention that's a lie of the devil. And, And that is a huge lie of the devil. Whatever it is that you're going through, whether it's struggling with an addiction Mm -hmm. or whatever it is, when you think I'm the only one going through this, lie, such a lie. Yes. When you bring it to the light, you realize there are a lot of other people. 
Yes, exactly. So that's that's been great to see, especially since my book has come out of like, there's so many people even that I personally know that, you know, have gone yeah. through things. It's not even like on the internet and there's people following me that are saying it. It's people in my own community. So that's been super, super cool to see and really cool to be at this point where it's like, this is nothing I ever expected or dreamed of doing, but this is where God has me and I'm just yeah. going to keep trying to follow whatever, you know, he has for me. And maybe it's this path or maybe it's something totally different, but it's, it's great to see how that's all unfolding. So what are you writing now? Are you working on another book? Yeah, I have two. So I have a fiction and wow. a nonfiction <laughs> book, but I mean, they're not, they're slow. They're slow. <laughs> they will not be out like soon. So it's mostly ideas right now. Um, so I, one of the things I've seen with my book coming out is just people talking to me about how I shared my story and was vulnerable with my story. Yeah. And I think I've seen in small groups too, that's kind of the first place I saw it where you can be vulnerable with your experiences yes. and what you've gone through and even what you're struggling with and your sins and things like that. And just the amount of help you get when you talk to someone about it and someone <laughs> can, you know, say, oh, like you're forgiven. God forgives you for that. Or I've gone through the same thing or a similar thing. So I think it's really cool when people start opening up and sharing their stories. So I'm, that's one of the things that I'm exploring right now is writing a book that's about being vulnerable and why it's good. And, you know, having mm -hmm. those relationships where we're open and not just pretending to be perfect and fake, meanwhile, struggling so much on the inside. So that's one of them. And then I started a fiction book in college and I have notebooks and notebooks and post-it notes of things for it. And now I'm trying to just get a hold on it <laughs> nice. and get it into a form where I can actually write it all out and be good on that one. So that's kind of been my dream. And that was my, uh, I don't know, coping and kind of, you know, when I was really stressed out, I can just dream up in this world and that's a good way to kind of have some stress relief. So that's another one that's going on, but it's, it's gotten big and it's gotten scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right you've been here before yes. one day at a time one step at a time yes exactly exactly there are so many nuggets of truth in this i know this interview is going to help some people and especially those who may be in a series uh, a, a season that's that's the word not series <laughs> a season of singleness right now just coping and thinking about some of the things you talked about about facing the lies and getting in a community and dealing with your baggage. And anyway, A Single Life to Live. This is an excellent book. Where can people get it? Yeah, they can find it pretty much anywhere online that books are sold. So Amazon has it, my publisher Baker has it, and then yeah, like Barnes and Noble, Target, all those Good. places online, it's available. Perfect. Thanks so much for being here, Hannah. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a joy. Thank you. <laughs>